Morning guys. Uh, Dr. Ken Norberg, another fireside hunting seminar for you. I'm beginning this new series of nitty gritty uh, talks, and it's good, it could be several, several presentations long, dealing with what makes a big downland buck especially difficult to hunt. Say, so you guys uh, who got a deer this last fall, uh, and you got a freezer full of venison, aren't you glad now you've got that venison uh, with this threat of the coronavirus going around? You'll be able to eat on that. You know, what I'm going to do, I've got several roasts that we made from the front quarters and uh, hind quarters, and uh, uh, I'm going to use some of those. I'm going to take one out once in a while and, and roast it in the oven and get it done, and then I'm going to cool it cut it in a little piece and put it in a plastic bag, put it back in the freezer. And I will use that venison to make casseroles, uh, chili, different kinds of soup, all kinds of ways you can use venison. And uh, yeah, I can make a pot full of time and live on it for a whole week. <laughs> uh, especially one of those Mexican style soups that I like to make that have got plenty of spicy hot in them. But, uh, yeah, this is one time in your life you're going to be glad you got a lot of that venison in your freezer. Well, get to work here. Before I begin, you'll notice I, I created a jigsaw puzzle here. And let me explain that a little bit. This is a typical square mile home range of a big dominant breeding buck. Rather than having to say dominant breeding buck any, every time, I'm going to start calling him the boss buck. He's the most dominant buck in that range. And he owns that. This is a square mile area roughly. And he owns that. That's his. He's the boss buck. There's a lot of things in here that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, I've got another series going here of the nitty gritty stuff you need to know to be a successful hunter of mature bucks, older bucks, or trophy bucks if you want to, you can say it that way too. You know, anytime you get a buck that's big, uh, it might not be the biggest one in the woods, but gee, that's a nice buck, I think I'm going to have it mounted. That's a trophy buck, that's your trophy buck. And um, so I talk about trophy bucks a lot. Uh, we don't, yeah, we don't mount two and a half year old bucks, but there's a lot of three and a halfs that are pretty decent. They look pretty nice on the wall. That their horns, antlers will be thinner. They won't be as bulky, but they can have plenty of spread and height on them and look nice bucks. In our book, that's a trophy buck. Not a record book buck, but a trophy buck. Bigger than average. Bigger than what most guys even see in the woods. So, anyway. Getting away from that now, back to boss bucks. Anyway, this outer black dotted line is the is the outside range, uh, boundaries of this buck's range, and in its range, in these red areas here outlined, are doe ranges, and where I hunt, and in a lot of places where I've studied whitetails, including in uh, West Virginia and uh, South Carolina and Texas and New Mexico and Arizona is pretty typical. Uh, but where we hunt, there can be four or five, and I've got five here, doe home ranges inside of that square mile at that boss buck owns. And each one of the doe's ranges will only be about, on the average, uh, 125 acres. There's some that are only 90 acres, like this one here, and some that might be 250 acres, a big one like here, that, that, that can happen. But they're all separated, they don't overlap. Uh, does don't like other does with young in their ranges, and they can be pretty vicious about protecting their ranges. So there's, a, there's space between all these doe ranges. Now, there's some other dotted lines inside here, and those a mark ranges of lesser mature bucks. bucks. Now, a lesser buck, in my book, is any buck that is not a dominant breeding buck or the boss buck. Uh, some of those lesser bucks can be really huge bucks, you know. Uh, they just happen to be living in a range where 
one of them is tougher than all the rest. He's better in battle. He, he's managed to whip all the others in battle. And so he's the boss buck. There's some pretty nice bucks out there. Like my biggest buck was a, was a loner who lived in a swamp. And I learned on, when, uh, on butchering that your wife who lived in the swamp, he had a spent 30 caliber bullet under the skin of his neck. And I suppose that left a, that made a lasting impression on him. He just said, I'm not going to live out there where all those other deer live anymore. I'm going to live all by myself in this big elder swamp. And there's cedar trees in there as well. Water puddles all over in there. And uh, that's another story. Someday maybe we'll get around to talking about taking individual bucks. But that's one I'll never forget. That wasn't easy. That was a tough one. But anyway, buck ranges overlap. Now, these lesser bucks that live within uh, that buck range, and I'm not talking about yearling bucks. These are two and a half to six and a half year old bucks. And where we hunt, it's not uncommon to have at least three bucks ranging in age from two and a half to six and a half years of age living in a dominant bucks one square mile range. So there's other bucks in there. And uh, not counting yearling bucks. Now yearling bucks live on the ranges of their mothers. They, are, they stay with their mothers throughout the year that they're a fawn and throughout the year that they're a yearling. And not until they're two, you know, they're after they've survived Two hunting seasons. I see us fawn and yearling. Two. Are they? Do they? Are they chased away by their mothers? Go find your own range now. You can't live here anymore. Uh, so the two-year-olds are always looking for new ranges to establish for themselves. Their first personal ranges, and some of them have to travel quite a long ways. Maybe go five, six miles before they find an open range that's suitable in size and everything else. Uh, that is not currently owned by some other buck. And uh, so this take, you know, that means that the progeny of each doe ends up living somewhere else, which is a good idea. That's one of nature's ways to prevent inbreeding, you know, is always difficult. You know, a buck might, one of these lesser bucks might be killed during a hunting season like last year. And so there's an empty buck range in there. Well, one of those two-year-olds that's hunting around for a place to live this coming year might end up replacing the buck that was killed in one of these other buck ranges last November. And a small ant rub recently made. It's still damp. <laughs> it's, uh, it looks like a yearling buck antler rub. So there's this constant interchange going on. The does. They kind of, you know, does can live 14 years in the wild. They don't, not many live that long, but they live quite a bit longer than bucks. And uh, there's good reason for that. But anyway, so they, once they establish a range, unless they're killed during the previous hunting season, when they come back in the spring, they go right back to their previous range and, and reestablish them, them, themselves there and when they leave their wintering areas. Uh, at snow melt in the spring. So anyway, uh, in areas where does are hunted legally, and they are where we are, but we don't hunt does. For, and I've talked about why in many of my previous seminars, but uh, these does have been around a while. And when they, those that live to be old, you know, get up there at five, six, seven years of age, they are pretty smart does, and they've proven it because they're still alive, and they're really good about protecting their young, like their fawns. Fawn, their fawns have a good chance of surviving hunting seasons because their mothers are so smart about avoiding hunters. Uh, yearlings start exploring off-range, outside of the mother's range, in the fall of their yearling year during hunting seasons, for example. And the yearling that's been living there, he might be walking anywhere in this area. He's exploring, and I, I guess it's all right, <laughs> but he's exploring. And when they get away from their mothers at, during the hunting season to get uh, encountered by a hunter, 
all of a sudden they're in a panic. They know this is possibly dangerous, and maybe not. Some of them are just overcome by curiosity, and they, they're trying to what is that over there? Or what's that in the tree over there? Or what is something like that? And become easy victims of hunters. The yearling bucks are probably the easiest whitetails in the woods to take because of their curiosity. They have a problem with that. But they start wandering around in different areas there. So they're exploring off range. And, uh, but anyway, this is the way everything is set up here. Now these little black spots here, like here's the, the, the home range or the bedding area of the big dominant beating buck, the boss buck that lives in the area. And they're always close to water. Here's a beaver pond out there in the woods or just a pond. And, uh, but there's, there's uh, these other black spots are bedding areas of, of bucks now. Bedding areas of bucks, uh, mature bucks, are small. Usually they're only like one or two acres in size, just little small secluded little areas off trail. There aren't, there may not be any trails in there that are noticeable where the buck likes to bed. And that's what he likes it. He doesn't want wolves traveling regularly around where he likes to bed, especially in the in a spring, summer, and fall when he's growing antlers. He doesn't want to have to run in the woods. He doesn't want to be bothered by anybody. It's different in farm areas where they learn humans aren't all dangerous uh, most of the year when they're, uh, when they're not acting like they're hunting. So they, they might be, they might travel a lot more and speed regularly in farm fields where people see them all the time and they seem pretty tame out there. But in forest areas, uh, especially where there's wolves and coyotes, and I know even in Alabama they have big coyote problems. Uh, these big bucks like to be in very secluded places, in the little small areas. Now, inside of doe ranges, uh, these blackened areas here like that are, are doe bedding areas. And doe bedding areas tend to be pretty large. They can be up to 20 acres in size because uh, it, 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 lot of, usually they like mixed, mixed timber, it can be brushy, uh, deep grasses. They love deep grasses for bedding because a fawn lays down deep grass, you just won't see them unless you often, almost step on them. And they like our large areas because they don't want any one area uh, to get to be uh, rich with fawn odors. And fawns have, uh, they, they have odors. Uh, much, you know, it's commonly believed they don't have any odor and so wolves can't find them, but that's just not true. Our wolves find them just fine all summer long. But anyway, they keep moving around so fawn odors don't build up in any one place. And that's pretty smart of those to do that. So they have large bedding areas. Okay, and these green spots, those are feeding areas. They have feeding areas all over. Actually, well, a lot of, like an area this size here of a, a Doe range might have 10 feeding areas in them, different kinds, you know, browse mostly in one place and uh, like for winter food or grasses of various kinds, different open areas for, for uh, graze in spring, summer, and early fall. So these Duncan areas are, are feeding areas, uh, favorite feeding, or the green areas, I'm sorry, the green areas are favorite feeding areas within each of these. And in the middle here, like this, like where we hunt, uh, we have some large clear cuts, like there's one here, and we'll say that's a clear cut as well. And if you got one like that, all of these does here that living around that clear cut will share, will share a big one like that. Well, these guys might just feed over here, and these guys might just feed over here, and so forth. That you know, the doe and her young, her ponds and yearlings. And they even get mixed up once in a while. When they're sharing a, a large feeding area like that, they don't seem to mind that. They'll share the feeding area, but they don't want to share their home ranges. And they don't want to share feeding areas within their home ranges with other deer. But where they, they back up against a, a big feeding area like that or that, these, these adults and their young can share that without any problem. And uh, so that's pretty common. That's something to remember uh, when you're scouting and you're planning your next hunt. Okay, so now, 
here's a beaver pond here, and there's a little stream flowing through the area. And uh, so, the, uh, this is kind of a, you know, a basic setup of a, a, of a big dominant breeding buck's home range, uh, or what they call the boss buck. It's something to think about now. Now, I'm beginning this new series of nitty-gritty uh, talks, and it's good, it could be several, several presentations long, dealing with what makes a big downland buck especially difficult to hunt. Now, if you're going to hunt older bucks, you need to know more about them that, than they're, they're unpredictable. A lot, most people think they're very unpredictable, but actually they're quite predictable if you know more about them. And, uh, or a lot of people say, well, they don't, get, they don't get old by being dumb, and that's about it. And what do you know about those things? Well, you know, they, they're, they, they're with does and heat during, during November when, that, when uh, the first of the three phases of the uh, breeding phase of the rut are in progress. You know that, and that's about it. And uh, so it's good to know a lot, and this will help you a lot in the future for planning where you're going to hunt from day to day. So, but anyway, they have some, some significant characteristics different than other deer. And that, that's the thing. You know, bucks are not, they're, they're much different than all the other deer in the woods. And part of the reason is, uh, beginning at age two, they spend most of, well, almost all spring, summer, and fall until um, shortly before breeding begins, alone. And then when they're growing their antlers, they want to be alone. But because they're alone, they develop different ways. Uh, you know, they have to, when, those are never quite alone. They've got their young and yearlings with them, which act as sentinels. Wherever they go, there's extra eyes and ears and noses uh, keeping track of possible danger. And even little fawns can be pretty good sentinels. Their mother can be feeding and their head down not paying any attention to what's going along and the fawn's following behind and the fawn makes a little noise. Mom, like, you know, what's that over there? And she'll just put her head up and look at the fawn looking over there and she'll warn her mother. That a fawn will warn its mother and a yearling the same. They'll warn each one another about potential danger. But the big bucks don't have that advantage. They're alone much of their lives. And so, for them to for them to be able to survive, they make up for a lack of all these other deer around them that help uh, avoid danger. Uh, they have to become uh, more alert to sounds and sights and and uh, odors that that tell them that there's a hunter over there, a human hunter. They, so and. You know, and they learn different ways of avoiding hunters. Quite a few that you, that does and yearlings and fawns rarely do. They do things much differently through most of their lives. Uh, when they're with a doe in heat, it might not be that way. They're kind of dependent on the doe. They're, they're in, they they kind of lose track of what's going on around them. But that doe and her young are helping to protect the buck while while the buck is with a doe in heat. So he's got the advantage there. But the rest of the time, he's on his own. And if he's fortunate to survive his, when he's a two and a half year old buck in the fall, this is the first fall he's facing danger of hunters all along. If he gets through that one, then from that time on, uh, by the time he's a three and a half year old buck to fall and fall, he is going to be really tough to hunt. He's going to be much better at avoiding you than all those other deer. And uh, so that's a critical year for them as two and a half year olds. Uh, I've known two and a half year old bucks that were as foolish as yearlings. And uh, it's kind of sad that that happens, but, and so they're weeded out, they're called by hunters, and maybe that's good, you know, foolish two and a half year olds, maybe they should be uh, called from the population of deer because they aren't going to be offering much to future generations and being smart about staying away from hunters. But uh, the ones that 
had maybe they had better mothers, you know, older mothers who were really knew how to avoid humans training them during their first two years, so that gives them a better start. Or maybe they're just smarter deer. They're like humans. They have different levels of of intelligence, if you want to call it. A lot of people refuse to believe that whitetails are intelligent, but I'll tell you something. When you decide you want to hunt bucks only, after a while, you know <laughs> those deer are darn smart, older bucks. The ones that get to be three and a half to six and a half year old, and not many survive past their seventh winter. So you don't see many older than that unless they're in fenced areas. And then some of them can get to be much older, but the wild deer, usually wild bucks don't make it past their seventh winter. They die. Usually not because of hunters. <laughs> so, you know, where I hunt, they end up in bellies of wolves during that seventh winter, and sometimes earlier. But at any rate, uh, but they're smart animals, really intelligent animals. And uh, I'll tell you, when, when it comes to avoiding hunters, they're much better at it than you are in, in encountering them one way or another. People can argue about this forever. The best way to hunt older bucks is stand hunting, and so that's our basic kind of hunting, but we utilize different stand hunting techniques to hunt these animals because we've learned you just don't have a ch you, your odds of taking a big buck every year are not very good if you just use one basic hunting method. You just stand on, and like a lot of hunters today, uh, tying themselves to one tree stand for the entire hunting season, it, it, that just doesn't work well for hunting older bucks. And you, you've already learned why, and I've talked about these things, but we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, you got to have a basket full of different ways of stand hunting. Uh, you got to, you can't let those big bucks make a fool of you by staying in one place. Uh, well, in, where we hunt, we we change stand sites every half day because we've learned uh, when you're uh, when you're always hunting very close to where a big buck is acting right now today. And you know, I, we're going to get into how we find that out with our mid-hunt scouting, but, and you've learned about a lot about that already, but when you're always close, close, close to tracks or droppings or ground scrape, whatever, uh, that was renewed or made just minutes or hours earlier, uh, your odds of being discovered and identified and avoided by that buck for the rest of the hunting season uh, are not very good after you've been there at least, well, they generally get you within the first one to two hours you use a stand. In other words, when you got a stand, you do all this work. If you're hunting big bucks, chances are that stand is only good for one or two hours. The rest of the hunting season, it's not going to work anymore. That's the general rule. It isn't, you know, it's not 100%, but, uh, you know, you can use the same stand and maybe, uh, day or two or three or a week later, here comes another big buck. Maybe not as big as the first one or bigger than the first one. Maybe there's reasons that what these two bucks were in the same area and you might get a couple from that stand set. But don't count on that. Because once they've got you and they usually get you with one to, within the one to two hours, when you're close to where they are, you know, it, it they get, then from that time on, you're not going to you're not going to take that big buck. And uh, oh, there's so many other things about that. You know, just getting there without a big buck knowing it takes some special precautions. And we talked about that a while back, and I'll get back to that some more. But we take uh, I can I made a page of of 33 precautions us Nordbergs take every time we go to a buck stand site. Every single time we take those same precautions. It takes a lot to be able to get to that stand site without that buck and all the other deer living in that area. Are. You know, here's a buck living in this forest area, and there's five does. Now, a good, a good uh, a deer population in a forest area is about 15 per square mile. That works out really well for where, I, where we hunt. Farm areas where the 
where uh, twin ponds and even triplets are much more common than in forest areas, um, you can have 23. That's that's a good com a good number for farm areas or mixed farm areas, mixed forest farm areas. But you can have all these deer. Here's 15 deer in there in this mile here, square mile, and only one of them is the biggest buck. All the rest are smaller, and the the at the mature ones. There's probably only going to be about three others. Sometimes less, sometimes more, depending on you know how many deer are living in the area and how large you know, the the the, the boss bucks home range is. But at any rate, there's only one really big one in there, in the square mile. That's a lot of country for one hunter to hunt and keep track of where that big buck is from day to day. Uh, you can't just go out there in the beginning and say, oh boy, I like this spot right here. <laughs> and I can watch this feeding area here. Yeah, that's where I'm going to hunt. And, uh, but, you know, your, your success there to you is so, uh, what's really critical is being down on a crosswind where the, of the, where the deer are out there. And the wind isn't going to be the same every day during the hunting season. It's going to keep changing. and if, you're stuck with that and you go out there despite the fact that you know you're going downwind or you're going to be uh, traveling, you know, in, uh, downwind towards where the deer are in the morning and and, uh, and and you're going to be upwind of where they are when they're out there feeding. And you go there anyway and say, well, maybe I'll get lucky. Well, you won't get lucky when it comes to big bucks in a situation like that. You can't depend on that. One key to hunting older bucks is their their interest, whether their does are in, are in heat or not, their interest is does. It's their job in life to, to breed does. They all want to be, they all want to breed bulls. Even yearlings, they want to breed does. They'll even try to breed their mothers. Their mothers generally won't let that happen. But when it comes fall, you know, they all want to breed, and they know why it must be genetic in them that in order to be able to breed, they got to fight their way to the top of the pecking order. You know, each one of these, this guy might be number one, and this guy might be number two, and this is three, and that's four. The yearling bucks are at the bottom of the pecking order, this local pecking order of bucks. And this guy is beating up all these other guys, and they know he's... He's the boss buck there, and they respect that. Now that's good for the entire year until the following spring, even after they drop their antlers. Well, anyway, so but during hunting season, the fall, uh, and actually the beginning in September during bow hunting seasons, that buck is he might not be marking his ranges yet with. Uh, new antler rubs and ground scrapes. You, you mark his bedding area or near, near the bedding area with, with multiple uh, rubs on trees when, he, when he's rubbing velvet from his antlers. But that would be about the only place in September where you're going to find something that looks like a fresh antler rub. The, the really, the, most of the fresh antler rubs you find are made uh, beginning about mid-October. and almost all of them made by these older bucks are in bow in doe home ranges. Because what they're doing is marking their, their what they would like to, to have, uh, what they want to be is their own personal breeding area. And a two and a half year old buck that will do that. And three and a half all the way up to the big boss buck. They're marking, putting in antler rubs and ground scrapes all through this area. Although it's becoming less common with global warming. We'll talk about that another time, but anyway. So most of their interest, the bucks, are going to be in these doe ranges. That's, they might bed outside of doe ranges. They might bed inside them. There's outside, there's inside. Uh, here's inside. Uh, but most of their interest is in these does, and even uh, in September and October, uh, these bucks were traveling around through doe home ranges. Now, 
when you're in a dome, home range, there's all kinds, I've said that before, all kinds of trails. They're going every which way in there. There's trails all over. You know you're in one. And then you get into a place and, gee, there's hardly any trails here. You're in a buffer zone between doe ranges. And there might be only a few trails in there going from one to the other. A few here, not many, like more often like right there would be a good place. Maybe here, a couple over this way. But uh, then you're in a buffer zone. Well, if you, that might be all right, but if there's about six ways for a buck to, when he's traveling around to see, how the does are doing, where they're feeding, where they're bedding, you know, instead maybe some of them are in estrus early, I think they're thinking that. And he's going to travel around and check on where they are and they find out where they bed and where they're feeding and that kind of thing. So they have an interest, not as much interest as they will once does are in here. But all of the buck travels are going to be in doe home ranges and they're going to be using trails made by does. And uh, so, you this is these are places where they want to be. But let's get let's go to November. Let's say uh, whether those are in heat or not. By that time, bucks have got when you get into the last part of October, they've marked all the, tra the trails that with antler rubs and groundskin in there. What they consider to be their going to be their breeding areas. But the big buck about two weeks, beginning about two weeks before breeding begins, and he's, you know, he's been through this now. This big buck's been around for maybe four or five, six years now, <laughs> and he's, he knows exactly what, what he's got to do now. About two weeks, uh, beginning two weeks before the, it, it begins, and while he's making antler rubs and ground scrape, he's got to run all these other guys out of here. You get out of here. Yeah, yeah, you know. And it doesn't take much for them to be convinced because he's already beaten them up and they consider him to be dangerous. And, and so when, when he comes in there and acting real hostile and maybe uh, running over and click antlers, you know, that's a, that's a um, he's trying to get uh, the other deer to fight him, that's an invitation to do battle. They probably don't want to battle this guy anymore. They're going to back off and take off and run away and he'll run them out of his range and they'll live in little areas outside of his range or maybe outside of his, uh, inside the range a well away from trails that the big buck normally travels while he's cruising through his 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 uh, breeding range which is the breeding range is the same as his home range so but most of his cruises are going to be where the does are and checking on does so up oh, everything is going on in there so what that means is, you know, it's kind of a simple thing. When you're going to hunt bucks, you hunt where the does are. You hunt where the does feed, like in these green spots. Now, that if, if you go up at one of those, you know, that if those deer get you before you realize they're there and they decide we're not going to feed here anymore, we're going to go over here, uh, and you keep going back to the same feeding area, you're missing the boat. And especially if this doe is not in heat and this one over here is. <laughs> so you have to have a way to find out where is that buck today, this morning? Where should I hunt this morning and this evening and maybe tomorrow morning? Well, you've got to spend some time going through this uh, in a way that doesn't alarm any deer. And I, I won't go into that. We call that mid-hunt scouting or mid-hunt cruising. We'll get to that, and we've talked about that a, a fair amount already. But uh, we'll get to some more nitty-gritty on that later. But this is what buck hunting's all about. Uh, you hunt does to get big bucks. So you need to know where does bed and where they feed because if a buck is with a doe in heat, it's going to be in that bedding area midday. You know, she might feed here in the morning and the evening, or morning here and the evening there because the wind changed. They always want to go in from downwind. But, uh, but the, uh, during the midday, they're going to go back to that doe bedding area. And that, boy, you stand hunting a, a downwind crosswind of a doe bedding area. Well, those are in heat, especially if that happens to be the doe in the heat. Especially if you found fresh doe urine spotted with blood in this area. Oh, this doe is in here. This, see that range? If you find some in that range. 
And if she's feeding here, that's where she's going to be in the morning, and that big buck is going to be with her. See, so you're thinking it. But you got to find out about this somehow. You kind of plan ahead, but that's good for opening weekend, first two days of the season. And we are pretty good at it, because usually we take two of the four we usually take every year on opening weekend. But after that, it's this cat and mouse game going on through this square mile. <laughs> and uh, so you, you, you want to know where they are each day because they're going to be with the does. They're, that's where they're going to be no matter what. They're going to be there. Uh, if it gets real tough and then this buck decides he wants to be nocturnal, if you're screwing up all the time and you're, this buck is getting to the point where, you know, it, it's too easy to run into somebody here in, this, in his square mile during the day, he might decide, well, I'll do all my breeding at night from now on. And that's no big problem for them because when they feed in the morning, like here, this doe and that's in heat here, she'll start. She'll get out of her bed over here about four in the morning, then go to this place here to feed. There, are, that's pitch dark then. It'll be two, two hours, three hours before it starts getting light, and so they're used to moving around at night time. That's no big problem for them. Same way in the evening. Where we hunt in wolf country, they commonly won't even start feeding till the last hour before sunset. And uh, so, I, well, they want to feed for about four hours so they can be 10 o'clock in the evening before they're finally done. That's all at night time. And you guys that hunt in farm areas, you see that all the time. You're driving, so you go out there all day and hardly see a deer, and you're driving to town, go to have dinner in the evening or something, and come back to where you're staying, and well, there's big bucks. Deer all over in these fields where you've been hunting. Where have they been all day? They've been bedded, and they they can be really good about that. But at any rate, uh, yeah, that's what can happen when a big buck becomes nocturnal. And usually, they have to be intimidated quite a bit to decide to be, you know, to to move at nighttime only. So it, there's ways to prevent that. And we'll get to that too, but. Anyway, feeding area is a good place to know. And how do you know it's a, or a, a bedding area of a doe? How do you know it's a bedding area of a doe? Well, uh, the biggest deer bed, they like to bed in deep grasses. And you find a bed that's about um, 36, uh, up to maybe 38 inches long. And here's one over here that's only, it's 36 inches long. Well, I like, think those can be up to 40, I guess but 36 inches long here, or 30 inches fawns, you know, bedded near it in that deep grass. You know you're in a, in a doe bed, uh, home rent, in a doe bedding area. Uh, and you find all kinds of droppings in there because in that doe bedding area, because first thing you do when they get up is empty their balls, so there'll be all kinds of droppings that are a half inch or smaller, puddles in that area. So. Well, there's ways you know you're in a doe bedding area. Those, those are good places to know. Uh, instead of just laying around camp midday, maybe you should be out there stand hunting downwind or crosswind in one of those deading, bedding areas if that doe happens to be in heat today. Good thing to know. So, uh, and we do really well with that using our gentle nudge stand hunting method. And we've taken a lot of bucks over the years using that stand hunting method midday. And quite calmly, you know, if they're still on the ground, one of my sons will come into camp and say, Dad, I found railroad traps, fresh ones, on the way back to camp. And that means that buck, there's a buck out there, and he's under the influence of doe and heat uh, uh, pheromone that she releases from her body and from her urine. And She's going to be in that feeding, in that bedding area midday. You know, he comes in the camp. He comes in, shows up at noon. Well, maybe we better do a job lunch after lunch. And boy, we've taken some nice bucks by doing that. So when you when you know where to go, you know you have to be really careful with the gentleman. I think the down one guy can't be. He has to be able to get there without the doe and her young and the buck in there knowing it. Now, while she's in her bedding area midday, she's going to breed up to four times. And uh, maybe an hour apart each time. And uh, 
in between they might just be just laying around there chewing their cud, you know, in, in there and resting. But every once in a while, they both, all the deer there, the mother and her young, get up and uh, uh, she's in the mood for being bred. And they'll move around in there. And sometimes there'll be another buck, lesser buck. One of these other guys, he dared to sneak back and gee, he smelled that and he got over there and he's in that area. And all of a sudden, uh, you'll be, he'll, this buck will spot that deer for shadowing him, chase him. And they go whipping by, he won't go far because he doesn't want to go far from that doe when she's in hitch, you know, any other buck sneaking in there uh, to breed her while he's missing. So he won't go too far, but boy, it can be a lot of activity and the doe will move around in there or maybe bed in a different spot each time she lays down. And so those midday doe bedding areas can be super places to hunt, you know. Feeding areas early and late in the day and doe bedding areas midday while breeding is in progress. If you don't have snow on the ground, it gets to be a little tougher, you know, and I understand that. And with global warming on, going on, boy, there's been a lot of years in the last dozen years or so when we just haven't had snow on the ground while we're in the woods in November. And in cases like that, knowing where one of these is and knowing where these feeding areas are in our midday uh, uh, cruising looking for fresh signs and a lot of times our fresh signs will simply be very fresh droppings and you get close to you know our cruise trail will go close to feeding areas and we'll deliberately zigzag all over through this mile and oh here we're looking here very fresh Droppings made by a doe, and here's some small, little quarter inch, so it's fun with it, so it's a doe, all right. If there wasn't that kind of, maybe it's a yearling buck. That might interest you, but, but fresh drops, we don't, when we cruise, we don't go cross feeding areas, never. We go try to stay away from, but feeding areas been around for a long time, will generally have trails ringing them, a deer trail, all the way around, be a trail. And there's, there's trails like spokes of wheel going into it from all around, you know. The whitetails will go after this size of a bush, which they can reach, but great, great food. So lots of them here. Another reason for having a stand site back in there. You can't even see it. There's a nice boulder just the right size to sit behind. And between me here, and that stand site uh, is a really well-used deer trail, like I say, that's real common around a whitetail feeding area that's been there for a while. And you come to one of those trails or the trail next to it and you find fresh droppings, various sizes to tell you what kind of deer made the droppings. Well, take a look at what we see right here. It's a deer bed, and you see how the leaves are flattened like that? We, just, we must have disturbed this deer very recently, like it within the last minutes or so. It's hard to be, know how long that bed is. You can identify a deer by the length of its bed. But right here next to it is some very fresh droppings. And those droppings are three quarters of an inch long. I would say the deer that laid there and made those droppings is a three and a half year old buck. And all of a sudden you know, oh, they're feeding here now. There's a doe here. Look at here, this buck has got his drop in here. We got five eighths. Oh yeah, that's that's a you, two and a half year old. It's three fourths and bigger. Oh, that's a big buck, an inch big. The big dominant buck is here feeding. With this doe in that area, so I want to fit, hunt here. Uh, downwind in the morning, and crossway in the afternoon, and I don't stick to one place. All day long I go to two different stand sites in a day because I know that big buck is very, very likely to catch, find me, identify me before I have a chance to get them. So I, we keep moving, we keep them off balance. They never have a way, we never give them a way to know where we are. 
every half day. They, we, most of our staff says it never been used before, or maybe it was only used once for half a day during the previous hun hunting season, maybe a half a day during the other one. But those bucks, this year will be the first time we use it. They have no way of knowing we're there until they're really close, until they see us or hear us or smell us. And they smell us a lot more than they really. They'll get downwind of you too many times when you're in a tree or on the ground level while you're standing. And uh, you never even know they're around when that happens. Usually they fade away and you don't realize until later and they oh, here's just fresh tracks or fresh droppings and he was downwind of me. So he knows where I am now. That happens. But even if you don't find it, don't count on it having, you yeah, don't believe that maybe this time he didn't find me because they almost always do. So anyway, look at all the things you got to work with for hunting a big buck in a square mile. <laughs> now, my boys and I, uh, we have four square miles. That's a ton of country. Now, we try never to have more than two guys hunting in a square mile. You put four in there, all of a sudden there's too much trail scent. Uh, a buck is finding you much too often. This can get a big buck to say, no, I'm staying away from there. Or I'm going to sure be careful when I'm in that square mile, when you got too many hunters in there. So we try to keep it down. We hunt deep wilderness, you know, we work hard. I, I would say 75% of our stand sites are more than a mile away from where we camp. They're way out there in the deep wilderness, roadless areas. And so, um, yeah, we work hard to be able to hunt in different places like that every half day without bucks having any reason to believe you're there. We catch them by surprise. Now, most of the time the buck wins. <laughs> uh, sometimes you get them opening morning. And some of the, I've taken a lot of really good bucks from the morning, but I've taken some on the last day of the season as well because of the way we hunt. But at any rate, uh, so you never know. You might get them tomorrow or the next day, what you're doing, but, but I wanted to impress on you what you're working with and why you need the scout, not only before hunting season begins, but during the hunting season. But you can't scout during the hunting season unless you do it absolutely right. Otherwise, if you're scouting during the hunting season without knowing what you're doing, within a day or two there won't be any deer in there. That's going to be, there won't be any more fresh signs in that, in that square mile. And any bucks that decide they, it's too dangerous to stay here, uh, that big guy included, he won't be around for two weeks, or he'll become completely nocturnal, and you just don't have a chance to see him during daylight hours. So, that's, you know, see, look at here. Now, this is a lot, a lot of nitty gritty. Okay, guys, uh, I think there's enough for one session here. Uh, you know, talking about the coronavirus coming up. <laughs> I'm 85, well, almost 85 now, and I guess I got to be especially worried. It's supposed to be really hard on old people and young, very young. And uh, I, I guess I'm pretty old, and so I, I'm thinking I got to be a little careful here in the next, in the coming weeks, while this virus strangles this country economically and otherwise. But let's say you're sick with it, and they're saying, "Well, you're sick. You got to stay home." Take care of yourself. Get plenty of sleep, drink a lot of water, wash your hands a lot, and all that stuff. Well, what you need is, when you're there, is a good book. <laughs> and let me tell you, I got a couple really good books. You know, this one will keep you busy for a couple weeks. You know, you're going through this thing and reading what you, all I've got to teach you about hunting older bucks, you know. That would be a, a good choice for you. So part of what you should do in preparation for that two weeks, you know, I know is you don't want to be spending a lot of money because you may not be out of work even for a little while and you don't know how that's going to work. But you can, this would be a good time for you to learn what you need to learn to be a, a super buck hunter. 
and uh, you, you won't find what you need to learn in any other place in the whole world than in this book. This book has got it all, so good time. Think about that, you know, this is part of getting ready for the coronavirus, and you'll be glad you did, really. You really will, because you're going to love this book. You're going to love it the rest of your life. You're going to like this book because you're going to go to it often. So do that. Then if you're thinking about hunting bear, and boy, that's, that's, that's pretty exciting hunting too. And this is the Bear Hunter's Bible, always has been since I first wrote my first edition back in 19, I wrote it in, uh, in 1988, published I think a year later or that same year. But it, this has been considered, bear, considered the Bear Hunter's Bible ever since. And I tell you, this changed the way people hunt black bears in North America forever. And I wrote succeeding editions because, like deer who get smart about different things, like they got smart about stand hunting, they got smart about doe and heat, lure scents and things like that, rattling antlers. Bears have gotten smart about uh, becoming uh, victims of hunters using bait. And you have to know more now, you have to, more things to do, you have got more precautions to take to make it work. And if you want to get a big bear, you know, like we're dying 300 pounds or more, and you get a 300 pounder and you'll just shake your head, look at how big that thing is. <laughs> you see all these crazy pictures of the guys having their picture taken with the bear and they're sitting back there 15 feet behind it, you know, in a position, so it makes the bear look enormous. But most black bears taken by hunters today only weigh about 125 pounds. Yeah, well, we, well yeah, they say that was a 300 pound bear, everybody considers it's got to be 300 to be considered a big bear. And, and when you get one, you know, the first time you have one in front of you, oh, it looks enormous, you know. What? A, it, it's so exciting. So, and there's so much to learn to be able to shoot a bear that's three to six hundred pounds, maybe even a hundred, you know, there's some that big out there. Uh, and this is, this will give you instruction if you want to do with a bow. And us, my sons and I have taken more bears with a bow than any, than guns by far. And uh, you can do it safely if you know what you're doing. So there's something to learn about. And some super hunting that you can enjoy in the United States. There are black bears almost everywhere to hunt. So, good one. Another one that will get you through the coronavirus smiling each day. So, be sure to do that. And then, of course, like always, uh, when you're done, press that red button down there today to subscribe to my YouTube channel. What's really amazing, too, and I mentioned the last time I talked to you, we're these. We're at one million, just about. I think within a few now, maybe 10, 15, 1 million, 14,000 visits to my to these my hunting seminars on YouTube, and that's incredible. And I'm so glad because <laughs> I, I really enjoy teaching you the kind of things that you just can't find anywhere else. And the, the reason I can do it is because I've been doing research, honey related research, scientifically for almost 60 years now, put most of my life into this. And I'm not done yet. <laughs> so do that. And, and then get the thumbs up button as well. That's important to me as well. So with that, thanks a lot for watching guys, and we'll see you again very soon. Be sure to visit my website. Here's the link. Here you'll find links to my blog posts, my Twitter account, my YouTube account, my Amazon store with links to my eBooks, my son's eBay store, a money saver if you're ordering from Canada or other countries, my website bookstore, and much more.